Um, and I can't wait to get to that. We'll be looking at really what a more biblical road, um, Roman road, really is. But this evening, I want to speak of something a bit different. So um, I'd like you to turn again to Romans 1. And we won't stay in Romans 1, but I'd like you to turn to Romans 1 here this evening. By the way, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Um, I hope you've got your turkey. Look, you probably got to buy a smaller turkey this year because it's just you. Maybe you just got a turkey breast. I hope you got a thigh. That's like the good flavorful part. But um, that's something to be thankful for, right? <laughs> Praise God. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we'll continue with kind of our high-level um, uh, uh, overview of, of a theme this evening in Romans and uh, we pray God's blessing on our study, of course. This evening, I'd like to talk about the riches of God's goodness. And we'll see that it is found in the book of Romans, in Paul's letter to the Romans. Um, someone once said it this way, and I, I don't know to whom to attribute the quote, um, but said it like this. God has never stopped being good. We've just Stopped being grateful. Yeah, I can't take credit for that, but thank you. And I don't know to whom give credit. It was one of those uh, that wasn't attributed, but I, I appreciate that. God has never stopped being good. We've just stopped being grateful. Isn't that true? And, and really, you know, a lack of thankfulness or gratefulness often, not always, but often stems from a skewed perspective, right? We get really deep and down into our own things. And so this evening, I want to ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll kind of dive in to Romans and see what it says about the wealth of God's goodness, the riches of God's goodness. So be honest with yourself. Do you always view God as being good? I want you to think of it that way. Do you always view God as being good, everything that he allows to come into your life? Do you always feel like everything is working for you? I didn't ask you if you know that God is good. I asked you if you always view God as being good, and that's an important distinction. Um. Because we can unintentionally, and sometimes subconsciously, we may not express it, but to begin to view God as less than good all the time. We say it all the time. God is good all the time, right? We say it, but I'm not certain that we always believe it. I'm certain that we know it. But I'm not certain we always believe it. We sort of can become pessimists in some way or another. When something happens outside of our control, how do we view that? Do we tend to quickly think of something's going to go wrong, I don't want this to happen, and we start to go into crisis management mode? Do we look at at the worst case scenario, how many of us, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us developed a little cough since March at some point and you were convinced you had COVID? Before long, you start feeling something in your chest. It was really anxiety because you thought you had COVID, but you are certain that your breathing became more shallow, right? In other words, what do we do? We often look at a, a set of circumstances, our own, and we view it and start to believe the worst possible outcome rather than the best. All the while in church, we say things like, the best is yet to come. And we act like the worst is certain. And it affects our ability to truly be grateful. And to express our thanksgiving outside of an acknowledgement on a Sunday morning or at the beginning of a meal. And so it, it reveals really a deep down struggle that some have 
to see God consistently as good. And that's what the enemy wants, right? He, he, he works in your life very slyly. He sets a trap for you in the recesses of your mind. He wants you to begin to believe, even if you will not express it. He wants us to begin to believe that God is somehow or in some ways less than good. That perhaps his intentions Maybe not for everyone else, but for you are less than good. It's a struggle with seeing God as good. It it reveals a struggle that sometimes we have in believing that God doesn't always have our best interests at mind. And if we're not careful, it lives out in this way that we start to lose trust in God. It may reveal that we actually doubt that God loves us personally. Sometimes when we've, we've gone this way in our thinking, inventing worst possible scenarios and acting and preparing as if those things are certain to happen, when we travel down this road in our mind, we begin to think that all that we're going to get out of this life are hard times and unanswered prayers, and we plan for the worst hinders our relationships, it wars against our joy. How is it that we can have health, we can have home, we can have people close to us willing to love us as much as we will allow them to love us and still feel unloved and that things are more wrong than they are right? begins to reveal something deep down that perhaps God has not been very good to us. But God wants us to renew our mind and, and give us a reset. And this evening in Romans, as we approach this Thanksgiving season, I'd like to, the word of God to be enabled in this place and on the live stream to really reset our mind By speaking truth to our false assumptions, to even the voice of the enemy, the Lord tonight, as always, gives us an invitation to know him more closely, more truly, more fully. And he's reminding us that he's good. Not only is he good when we feel good, when our circumstances are working out well, when we feel loved and well cared for and assured that everything's going to be fine tomorrow, we also understand that God is good when we are in the midst of trials. And sometimes the goodness of God at first feels like something negative. We're going to break that down tonight. No, you're not crazy. All right? I know God's good, but I'm struggling. Sometimes the beginning of his goodness, it's easy in our carnal mind, our natural fleshly mind. It's easy to see it as something negative. Can I tell you? Tonight that God often uses the negative to reveal his goodness and change us, transform us so that we never experience another thing like that in the same way. But we resist. Not only do we resist the devil, and I think that we're doing really well at that for the most part, but we (laughs) we also resist anything negative. And sometimes we think God only wants to bring positivity into our life. But the scripture doesn't say that. I want you to grasp this this evening that God 
deeply loves you. It's more love than you can possibly receive from a human, and it's not the same type of love that you're accustomed to receiving from a human. Yet we think of God, we reflect on our life experiences in our humanity, and we, we, we sort of make God out to be a man, but God is not a man. He is not like a man. God was not created in the image of man, but man in the image of God. And so God doesn't act like a man. He doesn't act like a person. People have a light side and sometimes a dark side. Not so with God. I want you to understand God deeply loves you and He is sovereign over your situations. And if you can't rejoice with thanksgiving in your current circumstance, you'll be quick to leave Him when things get better. People always think, if things were just better, then I would be able to be more thankful. It's not true. True thanksgiving does not come from an idealized set of circumstances, but from a heart that is being transformed and purified and eyes that are seeing more purely. As we know, the Scripture says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It can't be. You can't wrestle your carnal thoughts to come subject. People think that I just wrestle my mind to a place where it will, where it will live for God by sheer force of my will. Willpower alone will not get you to live for God. We need a renovation of the mind. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in Romans 12 and 2. And so we, we don't need to just be conformed and conform our will to His. We need that transformation, and it only comes from presenting all of ourselves. Romans 12 and 1 literally gives this picture of throwing your living body on the altar of God, presenting all of yourself. That is a real trust fall, isn't it? Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's just like diving off the building and trusting God that God has got you. It's an incredible act of trust and faith to give everything to the Lord and to stop holding back. We hold back often, not only because we don't trust, but because we don't want to be hurt or lived with those perceived worst case scenarios if we were to give everything, truly everything to God. And this form of broken thinking, it comes from a broken perspective and worldview of God, a, a broken view of God. So I want to remind you that God is good, that God cares for you, that He loves you in a way that is incomprehensible to you in the moment. And if you're struggling with the goodness of God and does God really love me, you're not alone. You're not crazy. It doesn't mean that the devil's got your mind. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's hostile. It's hostility toward God. Some of these thoughts come at fragile times in our life. And so it's knowing how to view God that teaches us how to get through these times. Amen? Romans 1 and 20, we read it last week, but I'd like to look at it again. And for the rest of this study, keep your Bible open and turn to the book of Romans. All right? Romans 1 and 20, we really talked about the downward spiral or trajectory of people that were falling away from God. 
But I'd like to read this part again. Romans 1 and verse number 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. That's the trajectory. See, and that's why it's so important. It's not that just we should be thankful, that it's a good, humble thing to do and a good place to live and makes us feel better and more positive. There is an incredible danger in losing our thanksgiving. And so, although they knew him, They didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful. And look at what happens. But became futile in their thoughts. The carnal mind. I know God's, I mean, yes, God's good, all of that. You say that, but I am in a terrible set of circumstances. And the more you allow that. Look, we all have a preacher on the inside. And we all have a carnal person on the inside. Right, We have those voices in our head, and just because you feel like you have them doesn't make you somehow less Christian than someone else. It's which one of those do you feed, do you lean into, do you listen to, and which other do you starve out, do you reject? And so we understand they became futile in their thoughts, and, and because of that, right, they just got lost in their thinking. They didn't look to God's Word to combat the thinking. They didn't capture all of these thoughts and things that are exalting itself against the knowledge of God. They didn't bring those things into captivity. They just kept thinking, just kept thinking, just kept thinking until it led them down a road that suddenly wasn't as light as the road on which they had been traveling. It was a road that almost indiscernibly grew dimmer and dimmer as they walked down upon it. And as they got lost in their thoughts, eventually the outcome was this, that their foolish hearts became darkened they were darkened they began to lose the light that they had remember they knew God they lost their praise didn't glorify God and they lost their thanksgiving and verse 22 said professing to be wise they they felt because the light grew more and more dim as they walked, it wasn't a lights out moment. It was like a slow fade on a dimmer switch until it was nearly indiscernible. They thought they were becoming more intellectual. They thought they were understanding more. But in verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. What a journey. Now we'll pick up in Romans 2 and verse number 1, therefore you are inexcusable. Whoa! This letter was written to the church. Okay, now he's not talking about those people that knew God and didn't glorify him and neither were they thankful. Now he's talking to the church. He's writing the letter to the Christians in Romans. Again, a strong church. And he says, you, strong church, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. Hmm. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. In other words, You're kind of lifting yourself up, and you're calling out, you know, 
You're calling out the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and you've got a two-by-four sticking out of yours. And you're going to be judged for those same things you're condemning others for. Verse number three, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape from the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We often quote that last part, but contextually it means something much more deep, doesn't it? And so as we look at it, look, he's writing to the Christians who are judging others as if they are perfect, who are calling out others, looking into others' lives as if they're practicing from a point of perfection. They probably think in their mind, well, I may not be perfect, but at least I'm not like that. And he calls this despising the riches of God's goodness. Have you ever thought about that? That through this type of unrighteous judgment, remember, there's only one judge. Everybody say, there's only one judge. Everybody say, there's only one God. And I'm not him. Right? But we act like God very often in this way. That sometimes we, we want to be the judge and the jury. And the scripture calls this in verse number four, this calling things out and judging others when you have the same propensity to do those things. Maybe forgetting where you've come from rather than showing love. Despising the riches of God's goodness despising God's forbearance. Have you ever been angry? Don't show your hands. Have you ever, well, if you're sitting at home on your live stream, you can show your hands, but only if you're alone. Have you ever found yourself despising the riches of God's goodness, the riches of God's forbearance, the the riches of God's long suffering? In this way. God, I am fed up with this Christian. Fill in the blank. Put a name to it. Don't speak it out. I just wish you would judge them. Lord, I'm done. I'm done. I don't want this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I am finished. I'm so done. Do you know what the word forbearance? Well, let me let me finish the scripture before I get to teaching a little bit, because I'm, as we would say in Mississippi, where I went to school, I'm fixing to go there. All right. Verse five. But in accordance with the hardness of your heart and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself. Get, by doing this, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds. You're acting like you're perfect, speaking like you're perfect, calling out others when you even practice some of those things. There are many in the church treasuring up the goodness of God, the riches of the goodness of God, of his forbearance and his long suffering. But you, rather than treasuring up those things because you're allowing your heart to grow hardened, you're getting ready to get a revelation of the righteous judgment of God. 
a personal revelation. He's going to render to you according to your private deeds and action. And you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of judgment. He says in verse 7, eternal life to those who, now if you want to be on the life side and not the death side, here's where you go. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, Remember, the context here is by doing right and good, right? Not living in hypocrisy. That's what he means by obeying the truth here. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first, and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? Don't despise the riches of the goodness of God. It's seen. It's seen in how he allows other people space and time to repent and to grow and to transform. And we're often either helping in that process or hurting that process. We so often equate the goodness of God with blessings, don't we? As I said the other day, we sit around the Thanksgiving table, and if that's your custom or your tradition, you'll say something you're thankful for. I think that's all great. That's oftentimes things in our life that make us more comfortable or feel good. And, And there's nothing wrong with thanking God for those things. But we often equate the goodness of God with blessings, with stuff that he gives us. But perhaps an even better measure of the ultimate and incomparable goodness of God is not seen only in the things that he gives us, but the things he holds back from us. God forbears. In the riches of his goodness, he shows forbearance, as our scripture said. Do you know what the word forbearance means? Think about this. It literally means holding back wrath. Do you see that? Or is your view of God, God up there with a lightning bolt and a whip ready to beat you into submission every time you make a, 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 a misstep? Or do you see that in the riches of the goodness of God, he is the restrainer? The Spirit of God is not only restraining the spirit of Antichrist, holding it back until it comes upon the earth, as the Scripture says, but God himself is forbearing. He is taking this judgment of God. He is taking this legal form of judgment and rather than just hurling it at people that deserve it, he is withholding it. He is holding it back. He is keeping it back. It is not your goodness that is keeping you from pain and the judgment of God today. It is God's forbearance with us, his patience with us, his love and mercy for us. Forbearance literally means this. It's a delay in punishment. We can be sure with this. Our tempers can be short. Sometimes we may think, God, I just wish you would get them. I mean, we may not pray it as a prayer request. Lord, destroy my enemies. Turn that into Brother Sumter on a Tuesday. Right? 
We, we may not pray it that way out loud, but our inside voice, mm, you've had some prayer requests that aren't fit to be printed. Because we don't always like it. We like a delay of punishment for us, for, for ourselves we beg mercy. We promise we won't do it again. But when it comes to others, we want to call them out, sometimes in an effort, so that we don't feel so bad about ourselves. How self-seeking is that? God's love, the riches of his goodness, is seen in the delay of his punishment, giving us a space and a time for transformation, for change, for repentance that can only come through the very goodness of God, not in and of ourselves. So God is literally holding back wrath. God is holding back wrath in San Mateo. He's holding it back in San Francisco, in California, in all of North America, over the entire earth. God is and has been since the beginning of time holding back wrath. Can you see the love and the riches of the goodness of God? You may sometimes say, God, just get this person to do better. God, just get this person when we ought to be saying, God, thank you for giving me a chance to repent and grow. And thank you also for giving them a chance to repent and grow in order for me to be more like Jesus and talk more like Jesus. I'm going to have to act more like him. In other words, I've got to learn to forbear. If someone were to judge me as a pastor, as to be too hard or too loving, I would take the too loving every single time. God's holding back wrath. He is holding back the judgment of sin from coming upon us too quickly just by chance that we would repent, just by chance that by more exposure to God or things in life that we would come back to Him. God is patient. He is kind. He is loving. And He is so good in His forbearance in his long-suffering toward us. It could be said that God is good in his delay. <laughs> he delays our punishment. And he works by drawing us to him with his spirit because he is not willing that any of us should perish. He's holding back his wrath He's giving us yet another moment, another day to repent. And of course, as we know, none of us are promised tomorrow. This is how unrepented lives end up dying and being lost. Only God knows when we finally decided, no matter what happens, I'll never change. And it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Can you see how he leads us to repentance? Now breaking that scripture down, unpacking it, and understanding his, there is wrath and judgment coming. It is the law of the universe that God himself created. For sin is a violation of the holiness and goodness of God. And so he, in his eternal power, holds back judgment, the day of wrath. And in the riches of his goodness, he's leading us to repentance. I hope that that's beautiful to you. I truly hope that you can understand it. Forbearance and long-suffering provide us the space to repent before judgment Comes and these are the riches of God's goodness 
but so many despise the riches of his goodness. So many Christians, this was not written to sinners. This was not written to a weak church. It was the Roman church. It was the strong church to which this letter is written. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Why is it then that some have grown to despise conviction? Can we talk about conviction for a moment? Leading up to Thanksgiving, could we speak about it for a moment? Because a lot of people just say, only make it to church maybe every now and then. And, and I'm not saying this is why someone would, but a lot of people, because they can only take so much. Because the only time they allow themselves to feel conviction is when they're in church and they can't escape it. Can't turn on their phone. Some I've, I've seen it all of my preaching. And since before I ever preached a word, people get convicted. All of a sudden, they've got a problem and need to use the restroom every 20 minutes. Don't do it at home. They sit and watch TV for three hours, four hours, five hours. Come to church. All, all of a sudden, the bladder kicks in. A lot. I'm not talking about a digestive issue. God knows I've had them. But I'm talking about not being able to bear conviction, walking outside sometimes. And, oh, i got to take this call. I've got to do this. Because we're uncomfortable with conviction. And some people despise it. And I believe that we can have a distorted view of conviction because we misunderstand God's intention. Sure, if, if, if you come to church every now and then or even consistently but are living with sin, and you've, you, you, may rip, you may say you're sorry of it, but you've really not shown a pattern of repentance. If you come, it starts, instead of church feeling you feeling better and better, you start to feel heavier and heavier. The weight of your sin is exposed when you're not able to distract yourself from any other thing. But it is the goodness of God that will allow you to feel the weight of, the weightiness of conviction, the heaviness of the heart. The hardness of the heart won't feel it. It won't allow itself to. It will just deflect conviction when it comes, believing that must be for that person. If you often in your church experience, during preaching, during teaching, whatever it is, you always believe that word is for whoever's sitting down the pew. Some people believe it's always for their spouse. It's never for them right? You've got this kind of a heart that practices deflection. You know what that is? It's a heart that's growing harder than it should be. It's not absorbing. It's deflecting. Some people have learned and mis learned to, to misrepresent conviction and misunderstanding. Conviction it's not the judgment of God that brings conviction on your soul. It is exactly the opposite of the judgment of God. It is the goodness of this God who is keeping you from evaporating in this moment and your soul seeping down to hell. It is the goodness of this God that is holding back wrath. He may have allowed you to experience some things, but he's trying to get you to a place of discomfort so that in this place of discomfort you will run to him and it is the goodness of God. He is unwilling that you would perish, unwilling for you to be lost. And he is very willing for you to feel discomfort and a bit of misery if it will bring you to your knees and to a point of repentance where you will finally surrender to God. It's not the judgment of God that convicts you. Yet some people deem it as such. They come to church, I just feel miserable when I leave. I, just feel, I don't want to go there and feel that. It's too much for me. It gets me emotional. Every time, it's the sign of an unrepented heart. And we ought 
if that's ever been our experience, we ought to be honest with that because you can't be repentant and be dishonest. So it's not the judgment of God that brings conviction upon your soul to make you realize your guilt and sin. It is the goodness of God that leads you and draws you to repentance. Some people allow themselves to suffer with a guilt complex that is not of God as well. By this, I mean, the Scripture says there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, right, that are they're walking after the Spirit, not the what? You might remember? Not the flesh. Think about that. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Those who are learning, I, I will not allow these thoughts in my life. It is like a thief that comes into your house. You would not allow it. It is like someone coming to harm your child or someone you love. You would not allow it, yet we allow the, 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 the thief of our joy and our, and our thankfulness to come in and rob us of the most precious things of God. Condemnation, it makes you feel guilty all the time. Before long, you start thinking everyone is saying bad things about you when they're not even it can devolve into almost like a near narcissism in this way that you feel like every comment is about you when people aren't always doing that. When you feel condemned, you feel judged, you feel guilty all the time. The answer is not in just the other people being perfect. They're not going to be able to be. And when they're perfect, other people in your life won't be. Right? It is in you being fully liberated in Christ Jesus. For in him there's no condemnation. So condemnation comes to kill you, to rob godly things out of your life, to destroy you, to pick you apart piece by piece. Condemnation is the judgment that comes in your own mind before the wrath of God ever comes. God's holding back the wrath. That condemnation comes now. It's the opposite of conviction. Conviction allows you to feel the truth and pain of your sin, that you would repent and know the beauty and the glorious liberty there is when you're filled and full of the Holy Ghost. Don't make light of people suffering from condemnation. There's no magic for it, but there's scripture for it. Every day, you've got to get to a place, God, what can I do to be more godly? It's not just works, right? It's not just things. How can I be? How do I handle thoughts when they come into my mind? Help me to remember to capture them. How do I start my day so that I'm prepared for wrong thoughts to come to my mind? I've got an action plan against those wrong thoughts that come into my mind. I've got a way to resist the devil, to reject those thoughts, to, to bring them and wrestle them down to the obedience of Christ. I'm going to deal with them, not just try to make myself forget them. I'm capturing all of these things, bringing them into captivity, this scripture says, to the obedience of Christ. People who run away from their problems and thoughts are always on the run. Always, always tired. And always run from what they're not willing to face. Conviction slows us down brings us down, causes us to confront our sin, that the cross of Jesus Christ reminds us that there is life in him, gives us hope. As we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, 
He then lifts us up. We're not trying to walk in our own willpower, try to will ourselves into a relationship with God. It becomes something natural and something beautiful and something yearned for rather than something that's dreaded. It's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Aren't you thankful for conviction? I've often said this, I, and I've felt this ever since the first time I felt conviction. Thank God he allows me to feel it. Because if I can no longer feel conviction, if God's never correcting me, helping to realign me, because I walk in human flesh, then, then I'm concerned for me. Conviction is a sign that God, I can still feel the working of God, the drawing of God's spirit. The conviction is a sign that, look, I know the devil's lied to, to some in a room this size and on a live stream of this size, someone has thought the devil's told you, you blasphemed or you've gone so far that God will not forgive you anymore. Conviction is the proof that God is still reaching you. Condemnation is not, but conviction is the proof that God is still reaching to you, still loving you, still holding back wrath. Can you see God is actively doing that? That if he removed his loving hands, wrath would be upon us all. To me, that's beautiful. Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome reminds us that only God is good. We need to stop demanding from one another perfection because it's a model we can't live out ourselves. And when we point a finger in one direction, there are others pointing back at us. Only God is innately good. Maybe when someone said, God is good, you should say, only God. <laughs> well, that'll throw off the whole rhythm, won't it? I probably never said that. I just thought of it. But So Romans reminds us that it's only God that's good. Stop your model of perfection. You are holding yourself to something that, and others to something they cannot possibly attain consistently. Romans 3 and 10 says, As it's written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Two verses later, Romans 3 and 12, they've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Romans 3 and 23, that is the context of Romans 3 and 23 that tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's not saying that no one does any good actions ever. That's not what it's saying. But it's, it's really summed up in Romans 3 and 23. Every one of us deserves this wrath. That God is holding back. That in his love, in his goodness, in his mercy, he is stopping it from coming upon us. Thanks be to God. We by nature are not good, but God is by nature good. He can't stop being what he is. See, God is not like a man, prone to feelings, prone to being this way one day and this way the other day, prone to rapidly changing emotions as circumstances change with a light side and a dark side. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and he shall be forever. He is consistent. 
And if God is good on one day, then God is good on every day that there ever has been. He's by nature good, and he cannot not be good. He always does what is right, for God cannot do wrong. There is no sin in him. There is no wrong in him. There is no evil in him. And so, of course, the devil wants to pry his way into your mind, firing fiery darts from the wicked one that penetrate your thought processes, right? When your faith is not strong, when your faith shield is not strong, um, hitting you really where it hurts in the mind, and causing you to believe that maybe God doesn't always have my best interest in mind. Maybe God doesn't really love me like he loves everyone else. Maybe somehow everyone's got it all distorted, and maybe God is not always good all the time. But God always does what is right. He is holy. He is not only opposed to evil, he is everything opposite of evil. There is no bad in God. Judgment and wrath is not the dark side of God. It's a legal matter in the laws that he established. Really, before the foundation of the world, the enemy wants you to believe God's not always good that he has a dark side. 1 John 1 and 5. We ought to get out of Romans for just a moment before we bounce back. 1 John 1 and 5. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light. Someone say those three words with me. God is light. And there is no darkness in him I love the last two words, at all. There's not a fraction of darkness. There's not a bit of darkness, speck of darkness in him. God's love is light. God's judgment is light. There is no darkness in him. Romans, so, so only God is good. Romans 7 and verse number 12 reminds us that not only is God good, but that the law of God is holy. That his commandment is holy and it is just. It's not unfair. It's just and it's good. The words of God are not here to make you miserable and less happy. The commandment of God is holy and just and good. In Romans 11, if you would like to turn um, there, it's speaking in Romans 11 of the branch of the Gentiles that is being grafted into the olive tree, right? And, and the Jewish branches have been broken off of that tree, and now the Gentiles have been grafted in. It's denoting the relationship with God, and it says not to boast, right? Because you're not the root. Don't branches your branches. You're not a root. You're not supporting this thing. This is not your works. It's not your holiness. It's not even your right. It's the mercy of God that you're here. You've been grafted in. And so it's speaking of the branch of the Gentiles being grafted into the tree. And God is reminding them not to be haughty, but to learn from the mistakes of the Jewish people. This is the context of it. Romans 11 and verse number 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I may be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. You ready for the turn in this scripture? For if God did not spare the natural branches, the children of Israel, if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, 
consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity. At one point, God stopped holding back judgment. He removed his restraint of wrath. And when they fell, finally, he removes his hand and judgment fell upon the fallen. On those who fell, severity. But toward you, goodness. Can, can we just say that word? Say it slowly with me. Goodness. Right, think about that. What is on you? Stop looking at God like he just wants to destroy you. Understand the goodness of God toward you, toward us. Goodness, if you continue in his goodness, will you continue in his mercy? in his grace, in his love. You, 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 you aren't continuing in it if you keep it all to yourself. Someone who keeps these things to themselves, they consume it but will not allow it to overflow in anyone else's life, right? I'll receive the goodness of God, but I won't treat people with goodness. I'll receive the goodness of God, but I won't live with the moral goodness. I'll receive the mercy of God, but I won't treat others with mercy. I'll rejoice that God has withheld wrath from me, but I will demand justice on others. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able. To graft them in again. Isn't that beautiful? A branch that had a relationship with God, firmly attached to the tree, which attached to the root, right? Received its nutrients. It decides to fall away. God cuts off that branch. Oh, the pain. Now they are cut off from God. Yet God, in his mercy and in his goodness, is able to take that old branch that has dried up and died, bring it back to the tree, and graft it in again, that it would receive new life again. That is the goodness of God. Aren't you thankful? Romans 8 and 28. We love this, don't we? And we know that in all things God works for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to to his purpose. I want you to understand that. That God is overall. That any single element in the universe, he can change at his whim. He can drive it away. He can bring it closer. He specializes in the impossible. Miracles are not abnormal to God. They're his normal. They're not challenging for God. They're easy for God. They are who he is. When God gives a miracle, he just gives a little piece of himself. Healing is not a thing that God does. God is healing. And so he just gives a piece. He just gives. Restoration is not just a thing that God does. God is good. He is restoration, the repairer, the restorer. And, and he just gives some of himself. The Holy Ghost is not a thing that you just get. It is God giving of himself. This is the goodness of God. And as long as we are committed to continue in his love, for to love God is not an emotional love. It's a patient continuance in his love, in his goodness. As long as we will love him, 
and walk toward our calling in God. Remember, a calling not for your purpose. According to His purpose. This is why we always must be on mission. We've got to stop talking about my ministry, my this, and I know we all let it slip every now and then. We're not judging you for it, especially after tonight. We don't want the severity of God. But it's easy to say because we view everything and how it makes us feel. Once we realize I gave up my rights, when I, that the scripture says I was a slave to sin, now I'm a slave to righteousness. I'm a servant of God. He's not a servant of me. Give me this, give me that, and then I will serve you and love you more. We are a servant of God. And if we, if we follow his commandments and do what his commands, we, we have friendship with God, the scripture says. And so this kind of a love, it always wants and seeks to obey. It always wants to come closer to the calling of the purpose of God. It doesn't have a problem when Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness it's already traveling in that direction. When we understand, if we will understand that God loves us, when we understand that He has called us to work for and in His purpose, and when we get all the stuff out of our mind, these thoughts that war against you and your calling, and you say, restoration is not as big as I'm making it, I've just got to walk and do what the Lord wants me to do. He'll reveal it to me day by day. I've got to take the steps and stop putting up mental and emotional hurdles. I've got to walk towards God. When we understand that, that the God who holds everything in the universe in his hand, who spoke into nothing and created everything, this God, who will align the entire universe, not your universe, the entire universe, to stand at attention and work singularly on your behalf. That this God works these things for our good. All things for our good. Tonight, someone, as we reflect on our approach to Thanksgiving and all that we have and, and some of what we've lost, understand that the goodness of God is probably not just seen in that he's given us a house. That's the goodness of God. He's given us people that care about us. That's the goodness of God. We're healthy. Those things are good, and they are from God. But perhaps... The riches of his goodness is clearly seen in the things that I actually deserve, but he didn't allow to come into my life. He protected me when I was a sinner and I could have died. He kept me, protected me, healed me, refused to allow judgment to come before his time. Had judgment come in its time, it would have been here long, long ago. But when I met Jesus, everything changed. He's restraining it, keeping you from so much. Can you allow your mind to venture there tonight and see the beauty and the wealth, the riches of the goodness of this Jesus. I ask you if you'd like to stand with me here this evening. In scripture, we read it in Romans that reminds us that only God is good innately. But Romans 15 also says this. Paul writes this to the strong church. In the same letter. He says, now may the God of hope. It's, it's Romans 15 and verse 13. Now may the God of hope 
fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. What is he saying? He says it in more than just the letter of Romans. That although you in and of yourself are not innately righteous nor good, nor could you be, that you are living and abounding in hope by the power of the Holy Ghost. And when this presence of an all good, only good God fills a repented man or woman's heart, you also are full of who God is. You're full of goodness. Do you see yourself as that full of peace? You may not feel it, but the source of peace is not in a thing that changes in your life. It is the one who has already filled us. You are full of goodness. And he keeps saying you're filled with this and you're filled with that. What is he saying? You are filled with all of the goodness of God. Goodness is so much closer to you than it may feel on this Tuesday evening. And I don't want to acknowledge we've gone through a hard time, not only physically, emotionally, even, even for many spiritually. But I want to remind you that you right now have goodness ready to work in your life and do the things that you could never do. He shows you his goodness externally that you've not already been judged for your sin. He's held back judgment from you until this time. And this goodness of God beckons you to walk and to continue in the goodness of his love and the wealth of and riches of the goodness of God. 2 Thessalonians, and I'm closing, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 11 it says that we pray for you always that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in the work of faith with power. He goes on to say that Jesus would be glorified in you. You're called according to his purpose. And we ought to pray for ourselves and one another. That God would count us worthy of the calling and that he would fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in us. The work of faith with power. Tonight, God's, God's goodness is more powerful than any situation that you are struggling through. Than any dark emotion that may creep or seep its way into your minds. God is able to deliver us, to sustain us, to strengthen us, to transform and renew our mind. And so tonight, rather than somehow resisting the giving of ourselves to God and withholding pieces and parts, tonight perhaps we ought to fulfill that scripture in Romans 12 and 1 and present all of ourselves ourselves holistically, our bodies as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service or our spiritual action of worship, that we wouldn't be conformed to the world anymore, shaped by this limited, condemned, but that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Shall we pray here tonight? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity tonight, God. 
on this last worship gathering prior to the season of Thanksgiving. We thank you tonight, oh God, for this opportunity, Lord, for as you've opened the word of God to us, I pray that the good seed of the word of God, Lord, would be received tonight in our heart. Oh God, tonight, Lord, that those who have battled, Lord, with their thoughts, maybe those who have felt condemned, maybe those who have questioned the goodness of God. Lord, and rather than being lost in intellectualism and human reasoning and carnal thoughts, let us simply look at this, that you have not judged us. You've given us a space of time. I see in it the very goodness of God, the riches of the goodness of God in your forbearance, uh, in your long suffering, uh, in your love and your mercy, in your kindness, in your tender heartedness. Oh God, it's all it is all a revelation of the goodness of God so thank you thank you thank you tonight for keeping judgment from me Lord thank you for holding back wrath Lord until I could repent thank you also for all of the good things you have allowed us to experience but I'm making up my mind I am not serving you because you've given me some good things I am not serving you because you promised to make me comfortable every day I am serving you God because your goodness has led me to repentance it's led me to change it's led me to renewing and transformation he could a robo sada la 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 baya. That's it, somebody. Oh, all over this room. If you're on the live stream, pray right where you are, oh God. Oh God, I'm thankful. Oh God, I'm grateful. You are good. Oh, I'm so thankful. You are good. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. That's all right, everybody sing that. Hallelujah. Yes, oh God, yes, oh God. You are good. You are good. You are good. Your mercy is Jesus. I thank you for your mercy that is everlasting. I proclaim your goodness. I declare it over my life. I'm already walking in it. Even when things may feel bad, even though when I look by sight, they may look bad, I am walking in the goodness of God. I am walking in the goodness of a loving, kind, and gentle, merciful God in Savior. Jesus Christ, I thank you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. your forbearance. I will embrace your long suffering, your mercy. Oh, oh.
of God, the goodness of God, a revelation of the goodness of God. Oh Lord, help me to understand it's something I know. If you're on our live stream, we're just going to continue to pray here. Maybe cut the lights a little bit in the back. But um, if you're here on the live stream with us, we thank you for joining us this evening. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Praise God. Thank you for joining us. Praise the Lord, everyone. If you'd like to just take another moment, if you need to be dismissed, we understand that many of you drive up. Calls me to rely. 